Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Virology Live. Today is session number eight. We are going to be talking about viral DNA replication. Welcome, everyone, uh, from uh, all around the world, apparently. It's great. So let's dive right in here for two hours of the coolest subject on the planet. As you know already, all viral genomes have to be replicated to make new progeny, and that goes for uh, viral DNA genomes as well. And here is today's cast of characters. Of, of course, this is the Baltimore scheme, and in the middle here is mRNA. This should be a scheme very familiar to all of you. And on the top are those viruses uh, with DNA genomes. We have viruses with single-stranded DNA genomes. We have uh, gapped double-stranded DNA viruses. We're not actually going to talk about uh, those today. Those will be the subject of Wednesday's session because they have reverse transcriptase in their reproduction cycle, even though they have DNA in the particle. Uh, and so today we're fo and then of course double stranded DNA viruses that down there just above mRNA. So today we will focus on viruses with double stranded DNA and single stranded DNA genomes. And of course, only double stranded DNA can be transcribed to produce mRNA. So the single stranded uh, viruses have to be repaired first. And we're going to talk about those processes today. We'll talk about parvoviruses, adenoviruses, herpes simplex virus, and polyoma and papilloma viruses in terms of their uh, DNA viruses. And I see the video is choppy, so let me reboot my uh, video thingy, my bobber. Having issues with my um, video switcher. It's brand new, and I have a number of issues. And um, maybe it's a, a lemon. My gosh, it's not cheap. I don't know the solution because you can't get these things fixed. I, I want to buy another one. Anyway, uh, it's uh, is it still choppy? No, it looks good for now. Okay, so let's go on. Anyway, you all understand from last week that viral DNA replication is always delayed after infection. Why is that? Well, because you need to make at least one virus, <laughs> at least one protein, <laughs> and sometimes many, in order for a viral DNA genome to be reproduced. And so today we're going to look at what those proteins are. But last time we talked about how to make that protein, you need to undergo transcription. The viral DNA needs to undergo transcription. And therefore, that is why DNA replication is always delayed after infection. And in fact, the late phase of, an, of a viral infection is defined by the onset of DNA replication. All right, so let's dive into this. Of course, there are universal rules for DNA replication, and there are slightly different from the rules for RNA replication. And we're going to illustrate it, though, with the same kind of I image on the upper left here. We have a template in black, and it's drawn from the 3' prime end to the 5' prime end. Hybridized to the template is a primer in red. And then we add triphosphates to the 3' prime end of the primer. So DNA is synthesized by template-directed incorporation of deoxyribonucleoside monophosphates, DNNMPs, into the 3' prime hydroxyl of the, of the DNA chain. So we add bases to the 3' prime end. The DNA is always synthesized 5 to 3' prime via semi-conservative replication. And that involves 
the production of two daughter strands. So here's semi-conservative replication at the top here. Here uh, in the middle is our double-stranded, mm, well, <laughs> this is actually RNA, of course, but um, it's the same principle. Let's make believe this is DNA. I don't think we have a uh, an image for DNA here. Both strands, the green and the uh, olive green strand, are copied. So the olive green strand is copied. So the single strand is made double-stranded. And the Kelly green strand is also copied. It's made double-stranded. So that's what semi-conservative replication means. So it could be DNA or RNA if you started with a double-stranded uh, RNA and you copy both strands, it would be semi-conservative. Or double-stranded DNA, you copy both strands, it's semi-conservative. Now, what's conservative? <laughs> it's nothing to do with politics, folks, right? <laughs> conservative is when you only uh, copy one strand. So, for example, the Kelly green strand is copied once to make a light red strand, and then the light red strand is copied again to make it double-stranded. So only one strand is copied. So for, for all the discussions today, the DNA reproduction is semi-conservative. Uh, the replication initiates at very specific sites on a template called origins. Now, you remember last time we talked about where transcription initiates on a DNA template, the synthesis of RNA, mRNAs, for example. Those were called promoters, or the start site is part of the promoter. And... Um, for DNA, the DNA synthesis begins at the origin of replication or origin or ORI. ORI. It always reminds me of ORI Lieberman from This Week in Neuroscience. ORI. The synthesis is catalyzed by, of course, an enzyme DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, DDDP, and accessory proteins. What are accessory proteins? Accessory proteins are other proteins that are needed for the activity of the enzyme. And we'll talk very briefly about those today. And finally, even though I've shown you a primer here, DNA synthesis by DNA-dependent DNA polymerase can be primer-dependent or primer-independent. And that is actually a very new development in the world of DNA replication. For years, in fact, for the first, I don't know, eight years of my Columbia University virology course, we thought all DNA synthesis is primer dependent. And, you know, if uh, dogmas are made to be overturned, right? And so just a few years ago, uh, it was shown that uh, some DNA polymerases are primer independent. They don't need a primer. So here is a experiment that shows that. And in this course, we don't show a lot of experimental data, but we show some. Here's one which is an assay for DNA synthesis. And what we're looking at time on the x-axis. The y-axis is uh, the, the precursor DTMP, what well, would be start with DTTP, incorporated as a DTMP, which is a measure of DNA made. So the y-axis is simply a measure of DNA synthesis. And we have uh, added in this, we've made a reaction with uh, f four different conditions, uh, two different DNA polymerases with or without a primer. And we have a template here that's being copied. So we're measuring DNA synthesis. And here in red is a T7 DNA polymerase, T7 bacteriophage. With a primer, and you can see this very nice incorporation of uh, TMP into the product. But if you leave out the primer, that's the orange line, there's no DNA synthesis. So that is an example of a primer-dependent DNA polymerase. Um, then we have uh, another polymerase, which was the subject of this paper. It's a, a polymerase encoded in the genome of a bacteriophage called NRS1, which infects bacteria that inhabit deep sea vents of all places at the bottom of the ocean, right? You have um, uh, lots of bacteria down there, right, around those hot vents, and there are phages that infect them. So at some point, you know, people have sampled them, and why not study them? Why, why not? Because here we discover that this 
DNA polymerase from this deep sea vent bacteriophage, NRS1, is primer independent. So here, the blue and the green lines, without and with a primer, you still get DNA synthesis. A primer independent DNA polymerase, dogma overturned. You just, you just have to love it. Here's the structure of a DNA dependent DNA polymerase here in red. And if you remember the polymerases, the nucleic acid polymerases have uh, the topology of a right hand uh, with the active site being in the palm and the yellow are the residues that make up the catalytic part there, the active site. Uh, and at the bottom is for our reference, poliovirus RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which we talked about in great detail with the active site also in yellow. Polio is the, an example of a polymerase where the thumb and the fingers close. And so here is the active site in the palm there. Uh, the, this DNA polymerase, they don't touch. The fingers and thumb don't touch. There's an active, there's an open uh, active site here. And there's a, a, a template of DNA uh, that is going inside. And how this gets reproduced, we'll see in some detail in a moment. But the mechanism, again, is very similar to that of RNA. Uh, they uh, involve the, the use of two metals, two magnesiums, which are coordinated by two uh, aspartate amino acids in the active site of the DNA polymerase. And the aspartates, the magnesiums, help to catalyze the nucleophilic attack, that is, the removal of two phosphates from the triphosphate precursor and the uh, linkage of that phosphate to uh, the, the previous base. So now we have base phosphate, actually uh, base and, and ribose phosphate, base and ribose. Very similar to what we talked about for RNA synthesis. So that's why I'm going over it a little more quickly uh, than we did last time. Now, what does the host cell provide in terms of DNA replication? This is a relevant question for every step of virus reproduction, of course. And so, as I've said multiple times, viral DNA replication always requires the synthesis of at least one viral protein and sometimes many, and that's why it's delayed. That's why DNA synthesis is delayed. Viruses with small genomes require more host proteins because the genome is small. They can't encode everything. And in fact, many of the viruses, DNA viruses with small genomes, encode only one protein uh, that is involved in uh, DNA synthesis. And it looks like I'm frozen up again. That's really unfortunate. Um, let me try restarting again. I don't know, maybe it's the streaming software. I have to try something different. All right. And viruses with larger genomes, like the pox virus and the, and the Mimi viruses, encode all the proteins actually needed for DNA synthesis. And these are viruses that reproduce in the cytoplasm of the cell, so they cannot access the cellular DNA machinery, which is in the nucleus, and so therefore they have to... Uh, provide it all. So we'll talk about that as well today. How about the DNA polymerase? Where does that come from? Well, uh, the small DNA viruses don't even come close to encoding an entire DNA replication system. But what they do encode are proteins that, what I like to say, orchestrate the host. Uh, they allow the host to recognize their DNA and otherwise they would be ignored, pretty much. Uh, and we'll see how that happens. Um, we uh, will talk about polyomaviruses and papillomaviruses and also the, uh, the parvoviruses. The large DNA viruses encode either most or all of their own replication systems, right, depending on the virus. The herpes viruses and the adenoviruses encode a lot, but they still are dependent on the host. The pox viruses and the Mimi viruses encode it all, apparently. And we'll see examples of that. Now, what aside from the DNA polymerase, right, what else is involved in DNA replication? We have accessory proteins that are other proteins that 
make up the complex, and you'll see some of those today. We will uh, present those. Uh, there are, for example, an origin binding protein that binds to the origin of replication and, and gets the uh, synthetic apparatus there. We have helicases. Uh, we have exonucleases to chew up ends, as you will see. And, of course, very important enzymes of nucleic acid metabolism. You have to make the triphosphates. So these include things like thymidine kinase, which is a an enzyme that puts phosphates on, Ts, ribonucleotide reductase, DUTPase, and many, many others. Now, for these are all made by the cell for its own purpose, of course. And cell needs DNTPs to and, and NTPs to do its own uh, nucleic acid synthesis. Uh, but uh, viruses can either utilize those as the cell makes them or they can tweak the cell synthesis of triphosphates. And, and many viruses encode their own uh, enzymes that, that, that deal with triphosphates, the precursors. So let's take a pause here and uh, do a, a quiz. I didn't actually have to, to, uh, to do that. Let's go from... Here we go. One, what statement about viral DNA synthesis is not correct? A, large DNA viruses encode many proteins involved in DNA synthesis. B, small DNA viruses encode at least one protein involved in DNA synthesis. C, viral DNA replication is always delayed after infection because it requires the synthesis of at least one viral protein. And D, all DNA polymerases are primer dependent. Now, uh, before, but while you guys are chewing on that, we'll, we'll uh, answer some questions. But first, uh, the other day I brought in my herpes virus keychain, right, which everyone saw. The same company, which is called Lanza, makes a, um, a lovely bacteriophage pin, okay? It's actually a pin. It's got a little pin on the back that you would pin it to your shirt <laughs> or your coat. And it's really lovely. It is a, a tailed bacteriophage. Um, it's quite substantial. And there's a nice little card that comes with it with a picture of the, the phage on the front there. Nice, And it, you see it's numbered, and each of the numbers is referring to a key uh, on the back. And you can't see it, but it includes the head, the, the neck, the collar, tail, portal protein. There's even a portal protein here. Uh, this is a bacteriophage, of course. It's a siphophage. Uh, this is, as they say here in the description, the cyphophages are a large and important group. Features portra portrayed here are typical but not universal. T equals seven icosahedral symmetry uh, and typically six tail fibers. So a lot of good information on this. Really, Lonza is doing a great job. And that was another gift from someone. All right, let's have a look at the questions. Let's see. Is the primer independent DNA polymerase activity specific to viral DNA replication? Yes, that's exclusively DNA replication because the uh, DNA de dependent RNA polymerases don't require a primer, as you remember. And then it depends for the RNA polymerase, RNA dependent RNA polymerases, it really depends. What about human viruses? Uh, so far, yes, they all seem to require a primer. I mean, this is a an odd virus. Well, I, w I shouldn't say odd. The virus would get offended if I said it was odd. But yeah, it's an unusual virus. So far, all the human viruses. But you have to be open to the fact that dogma can be overturned, right? You see, when, when it's just me, I never freeze up. When it's the me next to the slides, it does. So maybe next time it freezes, it'll just cut me out. Thank you for organizing. Are these the same as the lectures 2021? I would say um, the spring lectures are about going to be about 10% different. Um, so I always revise. Plus, here we have a a live audience, which makes it very different because people ask questions that 
you know, I don't talk about. And I spend, so these lectures are two hours because I spend a lot of time answering questions. So that makes it really unique, I think, in their quizzes and so forth. Yeah, the pin is really great, isn't it? All right, so how do envelope viruses get into the endosome? That's We talked about a couple uh, sessions ago in uh, virus entry. You need to go take a look at that. Are there any viruses that encode for hormones? Uh, you know, I, I have something in my head that says yes, and I can't remember it, but we talked about it on a TWIV. I have to go back and look at that. So if a pox virus accidentally packaged a ribosome, is it a cell? No, it's not a cell. It's a cell ribosome. Many, actually multiple viruses do package ribosomes. It's not even clear if they're functional, but it's a cell product. So no, it wouldn't make the, the virus a cell. It's not really odd. It's just a bacteriophage of a bacterium that lives at the bottom of the ocean. So it's not odd. It's just... What's the word I'm looking for? It's not the viruses we normally study. Okay, maybe that's a good one. All right, so let's have a look now. And this will be, um, that will be the last question. All right, where's the, uh, how do I get back there? <laughs> okay, 60 today. Show the results. The answer is, of course, uh, all DNA polymerases are primer dependent. That's the wrong answer, right? You should have all gotten that because I did spend seven minutes on it. Large DNA viruses encode many proteins. That's right. Small DNA viruses encode at least one protein involved in DNA synthesis. That's right. Viral DNA replication is always delayed after infection because it requires the synthesis of at least one viral protein. Absolutely. That is correct. All right. There will be more quizzes to check your learning. So today we're going to talk about the replication of a diverse number of viral DNA structures, and they're shown here. We're going to talk about parvovirus genome, which is a single-stranded DNA with unusual terminal repeats. We are going to talk about polyomavirus genomes, which are circular, double-stranded DNAs. The parvo is 4,600 bases. It shouldn't be base pairs. That's wrong. I don't know if that's something I wrote or is it from the figure. I need to find out. Let's see. Yeah, that's from the figure in the book, so that's wrong. Simian virus, 45,234 base pairs of double-stranded DNA circular. Adenovirus, 35,000, almost 36,000 uh, base pairs of double-stranded DNA. There's another typo. We don't need that extra B. Um, this are linear double-stranded genomes. Herpes simplex virus, also linear double-stranded except 150,000 uh, base pairs. Uh, and finally, uh, the, the pox virus, vaccinia virus, 200,000 base pairs. Uh, but the ends are terminally covalent. The ends are covalently joined, so we have a terminal loop there, so that makes it unique. So. These are the topics for today. How do we reproduce these? Now, first of all, um, the mechanisms of DNA synthesis. There are two mechanisms, in, uh, broadly speaking, shown on this slide. On the left, a replication fork. On the right, strand displacement. You also see that flashing of the slides? I don't know what's causing that. You know, I come in here and I spend all day teaching and podcasting. I don't have time to troubleshoot my machinery. I have to do that. So replication fork we see for papilloma, polyoma, herpes, and retroviral proviruses. Retroviral provirus is in, in inserted into the genome. And so this is actually the way our genomes reproduce by replication forks. And the strand displacement we see in adenoviruses and parvoviruses. So in a replication fork, essentially, the DNA strands are separated. It looks like a fork, and both strands are copied at the same time. 
the primers here are shown in green and the new DNA is shown in shades of red. So replication fork DNA synthesis always requires RNA primers, always. On the other hand, strand displacement, you do one strand at a time. In this case, you've initiated with a primer um, and now you're copying the bottom strand, the minus strand here. You're displacing the plus strand, but it's, the plus strand is not being copied at the same time. Right? And then later, you will separately copy the top strand. So that's why it's strand displacement. The synthesis is displacing the top strand here. Uh, this kind of synthesis requires a primer in, in most of the viruses, except that one bacteriophage, right, uh, is an exception. Um, but for these viruses, it requires a primer. This is never RNA primed. It, the primer is either a protein or a DNA. So you can distinguish these two mo modes of uh, DNA replication by the mechanism of replication fork or strand displacement and the kind of primer. RNA primer is always in a replication fork. Strand displacement priming with RNA or protein, with DNA or protein, sorry, never with RNA. I shouldn't say always because, yeah, you can always overturn something. As far as we know, that's the key there. Now, when you reproduce DNA, when you reproduce DNA, you end up with a 5 prime N problem, and that's shown here. This is a linear double-stranded DNA, which is in many viruses and in our cells. So when you duplicate it, you have a problem at the five prime ends illustrated here. So we have the two strands separated because we're copying each one. And we have now copied the top strand and the bottom strand. We have a primer initiating the synthesis, right? Here and here. And then what happens in the reproduction of DNA is you remove the primer and fill in the gap with DNA later on. But the problem is, at the end, you can't fill it in because you need a primer to fill it in. You'll see that in more detail in a moment. So you end up having gaps at the 5 prime end. So this is the 5 prime end problem that's associated with linear DNA molecules. And uh, our cells have ways to get around it, which we will talk about uh, in a future session. And virus mechanisms get around it as well, as you will see today. So this is the 5 prime end problem. Let's start with SV40. SV40 DNA, circular double-stranded DNA. This is simian virus 40. This is a virus originally isolated from uh, monkey cells in culture and used as a model for years to study many aspects of viral DNA, viral reproduction. It does not infect people. Of course, it has relatives that do, and we'll talk about those later. But it's been a huge, important model for understanding transcription, DNA replication, cell cycle control, and much more. So here we have the circular genome, double-stranded DNA. It has a single origin of replication. That's where DNA synthesis begins. And um, on the left here, we, are, we have linearized this DNA just for clarity. It actually does not become linear when it's reproduced. Just to show you that uh, the DNA synthesis begins at the origin and it proceeds in both directions. So these are two directions of initiation of synthesis from a single origin. And now both strands are being re reproduced in both directions, as you can see here. Now, how do we know that it's bidirectional? Well... That was done in, in a way shown at the top here, involving electron microscopy. What they did was to cut the circle of DNA with a restriction enzyme. It's an enzyme you can get out of bacteria, which has a very specific set of bases that it recognizes. There are, home, there are many, many, many restriction enzymes, all with different sequence specificities. Some will cut this once. Some will cut it many times. So they picked a restriction enzyme that cut the DNA once, in a way that the origin would be closer to one end, and it, so it wouldn't be in the middle. So here you see the, the, one of these linear DNAs looked at in the electron microscope, and it's been incubated under conditions to allow DNA replication to occur. And you can see the formation of a little bubble there uh, in the middle, and that's the 
initial replication at the origin when the strands are, are denatured, as we will see today, uh, and um, uh, the, uh, the bubble begins to move. So uh, as you look subsequently with time over incubation, you see the bubble is getting larger and larger and larger and larger. And it's clearly going in both directions because the ends get closer to this end as well as closer to the other end. Uh, if it were unidirectional, the bubble would move only to one end. But you could actually measure uh, the length of the ends of the DNA, and you can see that it goes um, in both directions. All right, so this uh, we're going to talk in, in some detail about lessons learned from SV40. It's been an incredible system for understanding DNA replication, including, as you've seen, that replication from this uh, origin is bidirectional. In fact, it's also semi-discontinuous. And, and bidirectional. And here's a, a diagram of that. So now we have the SV40 double-stranded DNA. Uh, replication has proceeded for some time from the origin in both directions and to give us some space here to explain what is going on. So on the top strand, we have uh, replication initiating at the origin and proceeding to the left uh, to give us synthesis in the 5 to 3 prime direction of the product, right? And that's called the leading strand. You put down a single RNA primer there shown in green. The polymerase then begins to copy the top strand. And there's an enzyme associated with the complex that denatures the DNA, so it keeps denaturing. The strands separate. So this synthesis can keep going. It doesn't need more than one primer. So that's a leading strand. And in fact, there's a leading strand on both the top and the bottom DNA, uh, on the plus DNA and on the minus DNA. So leading, two leading strands here. However, on the other strand, synthesis is discontinuous because it's the lagging strand. And if you imagine, all right, we've got a little bit of the double-stranded DNA denatured here. You can't start synthesizing until you've denatured it. And then what you do is you put down an RNA primer and you make the DNA. And then as the bubble gets bigger, you put down an RNA primer and you make DNA. So you have lots of little bits of DNA with RNA primers. And that's the lagging strand. It goes in starts. In st I guess it stutters. There are two lagging strands. And again, the reason is that it is, uh, the, the three prime end is, 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 the five prime end is obscured until the replication fork gets bigger. Whereas that's not the case with the leading strand because there's one side of uh, priming and then it simply continues. Now, the, the issue here is that we have multiple RNA primers, which are then removed, and then you can fill in the gap because there's now a primer. There's a DNA primer upstream. It's no problem to fill that in. So there is uh, no end problem here, right? There is absolutely no end problem because it's a circular molecule, and eventually you can fill in all the gaps uh, by removing the RNA and simply priming with the next DNA piece that's upstream. So semi-discontinuous DNA synthesis from a bidirectional origin. What is an origin, by the way? Here is the origin of SV40 DNA replication. We're looking at the sequence of the DNA surrounding the origin uh, that is shown here. So here is the core origin from this dotted line to this dotted line here. You can see that it overlaps with the early promoter and the early enhancer, which we talked about last time. This would be base 1 or 5,243, right? The first and the last bases are joined together there. That's the origin of replication. Uh, this happens to be what's called the nucleosome-free region of the DNA. Remember, the DNA in the particle is, is wrapped around nucleosomes. And... Um, uh, this part is free of nucleosomes, presumably to allow DNA replication to easily begin there. Here on the bottom is an expansion of this region uh, of the DNA to show some of the features of the origin. And these include uh, an AT-rich element. AT, remember, base pairs AT are easier to denature than GC base pairs. And so probably that's why they're here, to get the, the bubble formed. Uh, then we have a uh, palindromic region, 27 base pair perfect repeats, uh, which constitutes the binding sites for large T antigen. Remember large T antigen. It's the one protein that is made early 
in SV40 infection to get DNA synthesis going, and we'll explore that today. But these are the binding sites for that protein. There's another palindrome on the other side, and then more uh, LT binding sites on the right. So that's the origin of SV40 replication. Here's how the replication begins, DNA replication. First thing that has to happen is that the viral DNA is uh, recognized by the DNA synthesis machinery of the host. So here again is SV40 DNA. There's the origin of replication with uh, the large T binding sites in the center. We then have large T antigen, which is the first protein made when the virus enters the cell. It's needed for DNA synthesis. The large T binds the origin of replication at these large T binding sites. And in fact, two hexamers bind on either side of the origin. What is the point of large T binding? Well, it denatures this DNA. And then, so it's denaturing it and making it single stranded. And then it binds a cell protein called RPA. And what RPA is, this little, these little beige proteins here, these are going to bind the single stranded regions produced by large T denaturation. So in effect, what is happening is that large T is preparing this region of the genome so that the cellular DNA synthesis apparatus can be interacting with the origin. So T is melting this DNA, it has helicase activity, which means it can melt the two strands. All right, so uh, also coming in here is another cell protein, topoisomerase 1, top 1, which whose function we'll see in a bit. All right, that's, that's part 1. Then you start the synthesis, and this is a rather complicated process that uh, you won't need to remember, but I want to illustrate it for you to show you how all of these events happen. Now, the first thing you need to do, of course, is synthesize the RNA primers, and that's done by an enzyme from the cell, again, called Paul alpha polymerase alpha primase. So that comes in here. It's probably brought in through interactions with RPA. So you can see how the T antigen is seeding this DNA with signals to recruit the cellular DNA replication apparatus. Without T antigen, the viral DNA, one or two copies going in the nucleus would probably be ignored. But this brings the cellular DNA apparatus to it. So you make short RNA primers. And then this uh, polymerase can also make short DNAs, right? And that can happen uh, initially on the leading strand of the top and the bottom DNA. Those are shown there. And here's a, uh, a close-up view of what's going on here. You have the Paul alpha primase, which is on one strand here at the top. And there, there are a no number of other proteins involved that we're not going to really uh, be talking about here, but you can see PCNA and RFC are all parts of the cellular DNA synthetic uh, apparatus. Uh, and then polymerase epsilon, a, yet another DNA polymerase, you see there are multiple ones, will now come in here and synthesize long DNA. So the Paul A primase puts down the primers and makes short DNAs, and then epsilon comes in on the, both the top and the bottom strand and makes the long DNAs. And these are the leading strands so far. Uh, then we have to do the lagging strands, of course. So here, most all the synthesis so far are the leading strands here on the top and here on the bottom uh, by the primer and then the epsilon. And then lagging strand synthesis can begin, which goes, of course, uh, in the same direction, five to three prime synthesis, but it has to be primed and synthesized, primed and synthesized over and over as the bubble expands. And then finally, uh, and this occurs in the process of uh, replication, RNA H is an enzyme that removes the RNA primers. Uh, the gaps are filled in, and then the ends are ligated together so that we have a covalent joining of the DNA strands. And so what we have here now is a very nice copy of both uh, the top and the bottom strand here. And all of this happens as the DNA is being replicated. In other words, you don't wait to make the whole DNA to take out the primers and fill in the gaps and so forth. So this happens as the machinery is moving along on the DNA. And this is what the DNA replication machine looks like. You can actually find movies of this on YouTube. 
which show uh, what's happening here on both strands happening very quickly. But here we have our DNA template. Large T, of course, has denatured the two strands. It's attracted the DNA synthesis machinery. Uh, and here on this strand, we have a detail of the uh, synthesis of RNA primers and the synthesis of short DNAs by uh, polymerase alpha. Uh, and this this is sort of feeding through here um, in the other direction, of course. And the other strand is being reproduced at the same time. Really a remarkable process happening in the very crowded nucleus of the cell. Now, when you get to the end of this process and you make a complete double-stranded DNA. Two things happen that have to be fixed. First of all, as you're unwinding the duplex at the origin, the rest of the molecule gets twisted because the unwinding causes the double-stranded DNA to twist around itself, and it becomes what we call overwound, kind of like when you have too much to do in a single day. You get overwound or overwrought, right? That's happening here. So these, this would stop DNA synthesis, this overwinding. And so that's where topoisomerases come in, uh, topoisomerase 1 or 2. And I showed you one topo associated early on with the DNA synthesis machinery. This will nick one strand. It will cut one strand, and it's like cutting an elastic band. Boom! It, all the overwound regions relax, and we have a relaxed supercoil. And then nick is fixed, and replication proceeds. And that happens periodically as the uh, replication forks get bigger and bigger. Then at the end, you have, of course, two complete double strands, but they're linked together. You take your thumb and forefinger and just join them to each other. That's how the double-stranded DNAs are. They can't separate. That's not useful, right? And so topo 2 now comes in and cuts both strands of one, so you can separate them, and then they're joined back together again. So you have to get rid of the overwinding, and you have to separate the two strands. By the way, at the end, this is called strand resolution. It's a fancy word of saying we separate the two products. Strand resolution, you'll see that coming up. All right, it's time for a, um, another quiz. Question. Uh, the SV40 genome is a circular double-stranded DNA. Which statement about its replication is correct? A, viral T antigen binds and unwinds the ORI. B, replication is bidirectional from a single ORI. C, the 5 prime N problem is solved. D, has leading and lagging strand synthesis. E, all of the above. All right. Let's check out some questions here. Go back to the last one. I don't know why there's so much trolling. Somebody, a lot of people are trolling and others are saying why. I have no idea. Go figure. Oh, I have 10% different lecture, variant or strain. I would say it's a variant, right, because it uh, has no new properties. I don't, I don't, who knows? <laughs> do, B, do virus infection of B cells affect the antibody repertoire? I'm not aware of any uh, case, but I do know that Epstein-Barr virus infection of B cells will immortalize the B cells, make memory B cells out of them. How about NRS1? Yeah, it initiates de novo. I don't understand why you're asking because I did um, give you a slide on that. Not sure. Lab demonstrations. Unfortunately, not. Uh, but this is just the first year of this course. Stay, and who knows? We could try different things. Uh, but right now, this is a, just talking. We're talking. Did you ever come up with a way to make feedback for the study questions? I need a bit of help. So what we do in my regular Columbia class, and by the way, this is not my Columbia class right now. This is a standalone virology course. It has nothing to do with Columbia University. I teach the Columbia course in the spring. It's not live streamed. It's just recorded. What I do there is we have office hours, right, and we go over 
the questions. Um, and that's that's one option. Or I could simply post answer keys to the study questions, which is less satisfactory from my view. It's more fun to talk about it, but I'm not sure I could come up with another hour a week to, uh, to, to discuss the questions. SV40 replication, how did the gaps get filled and when? As the DNA, as the bubble is growing, right, the replication bubble is growing, they get filled in on the lagging strand after, I don't know the exact number of bases, maybe a few hundred bases, they get filled in as the thing is growing. So as I said, it doesn't wait till the end. Can you comment on whether viruses usually use host machinery to keep the leading and lagging strands apart? Well, it depends on the virus. So for SV40, as you saw, the T antigen is keeping the the two strands apart. For other, vi other viruses encode their own proteins, and we'll see some examples of that today, actually. Do leading and lagging strands have different error rates? No, same error rates, same polymerases doing both, yeah. And someone answered that correctly, right? Is large T packaged with DNA? No, it is not. Large T is, that's why large T has to be made, the first protein made in an infected cell, right? How does Topo know where to cut? Well, it doesn't have to cut any particular place. It just needs to nick, it could be anywhere on the circle. So it just waits till the whole com replication is complete for the for the double strand cut. For the single strand, it just cuts it periodically. It may be responding to tension. I'm not sure about that. Uh, do a lab live stream. So that's a possibility that I go to the lab and film like live stream like Amy doing a process, but not for this semester. We have to wait for that. So there are a lot of questions on transformation which are going to be in a subsequent session. Please hold on for that. How is the topo signaled? It's a continual process, right? And I need about five TAs. Well, I have quite a few moderators here today. Thank you very much, moderators, who are doing a great job. And... Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it would be great to have people run reviews of the uh, the study questions, but I don't um, have that. Or a lab summary. That's another uh, option. Is you could have a course to describe lab procedures, but I think it's more it would be more interesting to have it live. All right, what do we have here? The answer, of course, is all of the above. Which statement about replication is correct? It's all of the above. Uh, T antigen binds and unwinds the origin. That's correct. Replication is bidirectional from a single ori. The five prime n problem is solved, and it has leading and lagging strands and all of the above. By the way, the five prime n problem is solved because it's a circle. There are no ends, right? There's only a five prime n problem when there's an end on the DNA. So moving to the parvoviruses, these are the viruses with single-stranded DNA genomes. Here's what the DNA looks like. Single strand, it encodes really only a few proteins, the rep, the replication protein, and the cap, the capsid, right? You make a shell, and rep is the protein. It's kind of like a T antigen. It's going to recruit the cellular DNA synthetic apparatus to this genome. Now, at the ends are these terminal repeats, which you've seen multiple times already. 
And here's the sequence to show you how these form. So here's the three prime end of the viral DNA. And you can see it's base pairing with a sequence upstream. And then the base pairing at the end forms this little T. Uh, and then it continues for a part here. So this, this is what's forming. I'm so sorry. My apologies. I get so um, engaged. So here's the parvovirus genome. Uh, on the top there is the single-stranded DNA with two open reading frames encoding only a replication protein, the rep protein, only the capsid protein, and two uh, terminal repeats. And now on the bottom is the DNA sequence, which will show you what these terminal repeats look like. You can see the three prime end of the viral DNA there. It is base pairing with a segment upstream to form that, that T structure. So the whole region is base paired. Uh, and it's present at either end of the DNA. Now, the, the three prime end, of course, is where DNA synthesis is going to begin, and that's the origin of replication. You see ORI is labeled right there. Now, so this is the primer for DNA synthesis. This self-hybridizing uh, piece of DNA is the primer. So you don't need a piece of RNA you don't need any other primer. This is it. It's built into the viral DNA, okay? The primer is built into the viral DNA. And so how we keep it there is actually a good question. We're going to see how that happens. All right. Here's the process on the left here. Kind of complicated, uh, and um, but we'll go through it. So we start with the viral DNA, which... Is, is forming these hairpins. Now, on the top, I have stretched out. I've denatured the ends so you can get an example, get a sense of the sequence. And I have labeled these with A's and A primes, which means A and A prime are complementary. All right, they're going to hybridize with each other. So this A here is going to hybridize with A prime and so forth. All right, so this is a hairpin as it comes into the cell, hairpin at both ends. It is single-stranded, right? The for, what is the first thing that has to happen when this DNA gets into the cell? You have to make a protein. It means it has to be transcribed, but it's single-stranded. It can't be transcribed. So it is actually repaired by host cell polymerase delta. This is a, according to the host cell, this is broken DNA. So it will be fixed, and it's fixed by a host cell enzyme polymerase delta. And that's shown in red here. So now the polymerase has started at the three prime end of that hairpin using the hairpin as a primer, has copied the bottom strand. That's the red product. And I'm showing you the copying is going all the way to the five prime end. So it denatures the, the, uh, the uh, secondary structure at the right end of the genome. That T structure is denatured. So the polymerase copies all the way to the end of the DNA. If it didn't, that would be a big problem. You would lose the end sequence, so it has to copy to the end. Okay, now that can be uh, transcribed. It's double-stranded DNA. It can make an mRNA encoding the REP protein. REP7868 is the name of the protein. And the, the REP protein is going to bind to the origin, and it's going to nick one strand, make a cut in one of the DNA strands here. Uh, between A prime and D, site of sequence specific nick. The rep protein recognizes a sequence here and makes a nick. Why is a nick needed? Well, because that's going to be uh, where we start DNA synthesis. So now, when you make the nick, this uh, hairpin, the the polymerase, the polymerase of the cell, polymerase delta will continue to fix that single-stranded region and copy it in red. So now we have a fully double-stranded version of the parvovirus DNA. And the repair sequences by polymerase delta are shown in red at the top and in red at the bottom. So the NIC is essential for copying that left end. So now the ends uh, reform hairpins, and now you have a 3 prime hydroxyl. There's still rep protein bound there, and that will recruit the DNA synthesis apparatus of the cell to do strand displacement. So now we're initiating at the 3 prime hydroxyl of the red bottom strand, and we're starting to copy 
the, the blue DNA. We're displacing the top DNA. So that little pink arrow is going to go all the way to the end, and you're going to end up with a structure that's shown at the bottom here, which is basically a fully double-stranded version of the genome, which can go back up here and start the process all over again. The Rep 6878 will nick it. The end will be copied and will go through this. So we have one strand copied, but the other strand is sitting here. It has to be copied also, and that will be copied uh, in the same manner that we talked about before. All right, so the top strand is displaced, and the bottom strand will be copied, and it starts at the three prime uh, hydroxyl, of course. So replication is continuous, so there's no discontinuous because you're always going five to three prime. There's no polymerase alpha. It uses uh, polymerase alpha, of course, is the enzyme from the cell that makes the primers. It uses the inverted terminal repeat to self prime. Uh, the polymerase delta is doing the copying, and the rep 6878 make that nick, uh, and they make nicks to separate the both strands. That's called strand resolution. There's no replication fork. There's strand displacement, and both strands are being copied. And, of course, there's no end problem because the primer is built into the DNA. And because the polymerase goes to each end to copy the molecule each time, you don't lose any sequence, so the primer is always present. Okay. Next, we move on to adenovirus, moving to larger and larger DNA viruses, so they can encode more and more of the DNA synthetic apparatus. SV40 and parvoviruses, one protein involved in DNA replication, the relatively small genomes, but now adenovirus is bigger, about 35 to 40,000 base pairs of linear double-stranded DNA, and there's an origin at both ends. That's where the DNA synthesis is going to begin, and synthesis occurs by strand displacement. So this DNA gets into the nucleus in a process that we talked about before, and in the nucleus, this whole uh, process is going to begin, of course, only after we make a number of viral proteins. So we have to have transcription occur first, which we talked about last time. Now, adenovirus DNA synthesis is primed with a protein-linked primer. So let's start with the double-stranded DNA here on the top, and we're expanding the left end. Uh, the three prime end of the bottom strand is shown here, and that's where DNA synthesis is going to begin. The primer is a protein called preterminal protein linked to a single C. So the polymerase actually produces that primer. The C base pairs with a G four bases in from the three prime end of the genome. Uh, then the polymerase begins to add bases. It adds an A and it adds a T. And then it slips back three bases because the C, it's a repeat here, GTA, GTA. So CAT will work to, to hybridize to the first GTA. And then synthesis continues. The, the preterminal protein is left behind. And the polymerase shown in purple goes on to copy the DNA in a strand displacement mechanism. So here we are having our polymerase, right? First it's coming in with preterminal protein. It's priming. The polymerase is now moving down the bottom strand. It's displacing the top strand. And as the top strand is displaced, it's bound by a yellow protein called DNA binding protein, which is a viral protein to keep it single-stranded. Eventually, the entire bottom strand is copied. The entire top strand is displaced, and that gives you this structure here, which uh, has most of the DNA, single-stranded DNA, coated with DNA binding protein, and it's, the ends are base paired. And why is that? Because the ends are inverted terminal repeats. In fact, whenever we show the adenovirus DNA genome, we have ITR at either end. Inverted terminal repeats means that these can base pair. They're complementary to each other. So now we have made a double-stranded copy of the light blue strand that's right there. That can go and enter the same reproduction cycle. So a polymerase can come in and displace the top strand. This can go over and over again. But what about this strand? Well, 
this double-stranded end here, it looks to the polymerase uh, very much like a, a bona fide end of the viral DNA, right? It's a double-stranded DNA. It looks kind of like this. So the polymerase will, again, initiate synthesis there by protein priming and make a complementary product. The DNA binding protein is bumped off as the polymerase moves down. So now we have a DNA copy of the second strand. So we've copied both strands, bottom strand, top strand, semi-conservative replication. Uh, and, of course, either one of these double-stranded products can enter this DNA synthesis cycle again. So there's no end problem. Why? Because the protein primer, you know, it, it starts a little bit in and then shifts back to exactly the three prime base of the DNA. So there's no loss of sequence. The protein priming takes care of that. It's really, really an elegant solution, I think. I want to show you the structure of this single-stranded DNA binding protein of adenovirus. Uh, its structure is known. Remember, this is the protein that binds the single strand. As the uh, polymerase is moving and copying the bottom strand, it's strand displacement. It's displacing the, displacing the top strand. These molecules of DNA binding protein, which have to be made before DNA synthesis can begin, are binding to the uh, DNA, the single strand of DNA. This is the structure of the DNA binding protein. It has a, uh, a, a body with a little piece of protein sticking out. It kind of looks like a plow. And the idea is as these proteins bind, they help denature the DNA. This little protrusion here sticks into the duplex and helps denature it. By the way, the DNA polymerase is also a viral protein. So this is an example of a virus that encodes its own DNA polymerase. It doesn't encode everything but encodes quite a bit, including the polymerase, DNA binding proteins, and a few other accessory proteins uh, that are involved in DNA synthesis. Let's do another quiz. This is question three. And this is, um, how is DNA replication of parvovirus and adenovirus similar? A, they both require protein-linked primers. B, replication occurs by strand displacement. C, DNA synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm. D, a replication fork occurs in both. E, none of the above. So parvo and adeno, what is similar about the two of them? And we will go do some questions here. <laughs> Thank you for your contribution. Is there a realistic picture of corona? Yeah, I do have it. And um, you should send me an email, vincent at microbe.tv. So we'll do it there for that. Sorry about not seeing the slides. Yeah, Amy in doing recitation. So I can't, I don't want to engage every Amy every day, every week to do it. She could do it maybe a few times in the semester, but frankly, right now she's overwhelmed. So I have to find out another solution to that. Yes, A and A prime are complementary. That's right. Why does the DNA cell copy the last part of the DNA? Because you have to rebuild the entire. T structure on each strand. You have to go and take a look at that. You know, you should go through it and write it out if you need to, but you'll see why. It has to be rebuilt, otherwise you're going to lose sequence. Is this right? Transcription makes proteins. No. Translation makes proteins on ribosomes. Uh, replication uses makes DNA or RNA, but transcription is specifically the synthesis of mRNA from DNA templates. With the ITRs, can DNA synthesis start at either end? No, not initially because there's only one three prime end on the single-stranded DNA, so it can only start there. But later on, once you have two strands displaced, you could start at either end, yes. But it has to be a three prime end always. <laughs> All right. Someone's asking questions about transformation. You need to wait till the transformation lecture. 
Yeah, the virus makes its own polymerase, which is a part of the uh, early genes that are made, polymerase, DNA binding proteins, and others. So if you're taking the quizzes, by the way, you have to keep the browser page open, or otherwise it's going to mess it up. Sorry. Uh, the, the, the quizzes are working. Enough people are um, getting them to work. Okay. Let's, um, let's move on to answer our question. Here we go. How is DNA replication similar? What's the answer? Replication occurs by strand displacement. They, both, they don't both use protein-linked primers. Parvo is, not, is a DNA primer. Adeno is a protein-linked. Uh, DNA synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm. No, not for these viruses. Pox and Mimi, yes, but not for these. They're nuclear. Replication fork occurs in both, uh, not in either one. They're both strand displacement. Right, answer B. And so B is the answer there. Okay. Quiz is working. I got 52 people answered. Um, you could restart if, if you have uh, having issues. Okay, moving to larger and larger viruses, herpes simplex virus. Here we have two, a big double stranded DNA linear, two origins. Actually, three origins. They're called or two ori s and one ori l. So, what does that mean? Well, DNA synthesis can can initiate at any of those three origins. It's a very long double stranded DNA. Uh, the DNA enters the cell through the portal. Uh, at the remember, the, the virus fuses at the plasma membrane. The capsid goes to the nuclear membrane. The portal releases the DNA into the nucleus, uh, and then, as you'll see, it's circularized and replicates as a rolling circle. But here, I'm showing you a number of proteins encoded by the virus that participate in DNA replication. Of course, we have the DNA polymerase. So this is the gene name uh, on the left. The DNA polymerase, we have a single-stranded binding protein. We have an origin binding protein. You know what those do. A processivity protein means that it helps the polymerase to keep going and not fall off. It's like a cup of coffee, right? or whatever your drug of choice is, without it, you kind of fade after a while. So the processivity protein is, your, is the cup of coffee for the DNA polymerase. And then there are enzymes that uh, make primers here. So let's see how this works. The DNA comes out of the particle into the nucleus as a linear molecule, and then a cell enzyme, a DNA ligase. DNA ligase, by the way, is an enzyme that simply covalently joins the ends of nucleic acids. It could be DNA for a DNA ligase. It could be an RNA ligase. There, there are a bunch of them in the cell. And so a DNA ligase will make a closed circle from the herpes virus DNA. And again, host proteins do this. And so then it's in the cell as a, as a circle, a double-stranded DNA circle. Now, uh, this is interesting because if this were SV40, there would be an ORI that could be denatured, right, which would then make a replication fork. But that's not what happens with herpes simplex virus. Um, the, uh, what happens here is that one strand is nicked by an enzyme, an endonuclease, to give you a free 3' prime hydroxyl. You always need a 3' prime hydroxyl to start DNA replication. And then the polymerase will come in here. It is a viral DNA polymerase and begin to copy the uh, bottom strand. Very straightforward. It, the, the top strand will move away. And as the polymerase is moving around this circle, right, it is uh, making the top strand come off. And that's shown in this next image here. And so as this uh, DNA is made, the other strand comes off. And, and at some point, it's single-stranded. And there you can get discontinuous DNA synthesis on it. You can put little RNA primers in green, and then the polymerase can fill in, and the RNA primers are removed, and eventually the gaps are filled in. And this continues. This is called rolling circle replication. Just think of it as a 
there's a roll of toilet paper, right? You're pulling out the sheets, and it's not quite the same because the toilet paper is single-stranded. It's not double-stranded. And uh, But the whole idea that the roll is rolling and you're pulling out the DNA, that's kind of might clear it, clear it up for you. So this keeps – the polymerase keeps going around and around and uh, making – product on one strand and then the other strand is copied at the same time. And so we have both continuous and, and discontinuous. And there's really no end problem here. Uh, eventually you make multiple genome length molecules all joined together. These very long DNAs are made in the uh, nucleus. Um, and eventually they will get cut when they're packaged into the particle. We'll, we'll see how that happens uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, but uh, I guess the only end problem would be the very end of this molecule at the left end after you're making many, many, many genome equivalents. But essentially, there's no end problem because they can all be filled in uh, by DNA priming. All right, and finally, uh, we have pox viruses, um, which have the long double-stranded. I know the toilet paper analogy is not the greatest. I, I understand, but some for some people, it works. Double-stranded DNA, but the ends are joined. So the 5 and 3 prime ends are covalently joined, which gives you a terminal loop. And if you melted the two strands, you would have a single-stranded circle, essentially. Now, so far, all the viruses we've talked about reproduce in the nucleus. SV40, parvovirus, adenovirus, herpes virus. They all go into the nucleus, and everything happens there with respect to DNA replication. And in fact, that's where the new virus particles are assembled. But pox viruses and also Mimi viruses and other giant viruses, they reproduce in the cytoplasm. They don't even go into the nucleus. Uh, so they need to encode all the proteins necessary for DNA replication, right? Because they're not going to have the cell polymerase. It's in the nucleus. They're not going to have anything involved in cellular DNA replication because it's in the nucleus. So these these viruses, pox viruses, memes, and other giant viruses encode everything they need for DNA replication. Now I'm going to show you an example of uh, where, where replication of uh, pox viruses occurs. These are some pictures that Rich Condit gave to me many years ago. So this is a vaccinia virus infected cell. Vaccinia virus is a pox virus. Right? There are lots of different kinds of pox viruses, including smallpox virus, which nobody can work on anymore. But uh, vaccinia virus is a related virus that you can work on in the laboratory. And so what we have here is a single cell that is infected with vaccinia virus so many hours after infection. And uh, in the first panel, the cell is stained with DAPI, which is a dye that will stain DNA. And what you can see is that the nucleus is staining very nicely. You can see it's a nucleus. Usually DAPI is used to identify the nucleus. But what you also see here is you have staining in the cytoplasm of the cell. How do I know it's the cytoplasm? Because it's not the nucleus, right? The nucleus is circumscribed by a nuclear membrane. So obviously, if this were an uninfected cell, you wouldn't see any staining here. That would be a nice control to have, but I don't have it. An uninfected should show no cytoplasmic or very little cytoplasmic staining, right? There's mitochondrial DNA. But here there's a lot of cytoplasmic staining. So what is it? Right? The next slide, we stain the cell with an antibody that is against the viral DNA binding protein. And there the binding is, is indicated by red fluorescence. We are using uh, a second antibody that's got a red, that it has a, a dye on it that will fluoresce red under UV light. And so here now we see in the cytoplasm, there are foci of what look like DNA binding protein, right? Defined by our antibody. There's nothing in the nucleus, which is good. Well, it's not good or bad. It's what we observe, right? Because for some viruses, the DNA binding protein would be in the nucleus, yeah. But here they're clearly in the cytoplasm, which implies that um, DNA synthesis is occurring in the cytoplasm. And then when you merge the blue and the red uh, uh, sections, not sections, the blue and the red colors, you computationally merge them because you have them separated. And now you can see that the red correspond to, the red are overlaying with the blue areas of uh, viral DNA replication in the cytoplasm. And so these are what we call factories 
which are areas, discrete areas of the cytoplasm where uh, pox viruses reproduce their DNA and they make new particles there. So the virus comes in, it's, it's transcribed, the DNA is transcribed in the cytoplasm. Uh, the viral proteins are made, of course, in the cytoplasm. The factories are made, DNA replication begins, and eventually uh, new virus particles are made there as well. <clears throat> okay, so this is how the DNA re replicates. And again, there are at least 15 viral proteins involved, probably more. It hasn't been all sorted out. But again, the virus appears to encode everything it needs. Uh, so the, um, the DNA reproduction uh, occurs on this uh, dimer. So I'm showing you the genome here um, with the two strands separated. It doesn't actually occur that way, but it is a single-stranded circle, which is base-paired along its whole length, and just the ends are not base-paired, right? So we think that replication initiation occurs near the ends. How that happens, not clear, but you would have to put down RNA primers, uh, and then the polymerase would start, the viral polymerase would start to make a DNA, which is shown here uh, at the end. And eventually, the DNA polymerase is going to go around that whole single strand, and make an actual double-stranded DNA, which is called the dimer. There's no end problem, right? Because the polymerase will eventually come back, and as these RNA primers are removed, can fill in the gaps. Um, and so now you have a dimer, and then you have to separate them. You have to resolve the two because the viral genome is single-stranded. Um, we're not quite sure how that happens. Uh, must, it may involve some nicking and, and separation, but how it happens is absolutely not known. But in the end, you have two monomers. We know that for sure because this is what's packaged into uh, the, the new virus particles. So um, there's no end problem because there is no end. And that may be part of the advantage of vaccinia virus to keeping a circular DNA genome. All right, now we have one more quiz. So what makes pox virus DNA replication different from all the other viruses we discussed today? A, RNA primers are used by the DNA polymerase. B, DNA synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm. C, DNA synthesis occurs by strand displacement. D, none of the above. All right, let's take some more questions. Uh, most DNA viruses do everything in the nucleus except the big ones, the pox viruses, the memes. But even the some of the giants are not exclusive to the cytoplasm. Some of them do both. But, yeah, we vast majority of the others are in the nucleus for sure. Uh the, the idea of a la live lab stream would be for Amy to join, but right now she cannot do that. It's She's really uh, quite busy. Is that the same process as Okasaki fragments? Yeah, it's basically the same thing, yeah. Does herpes infect the brain? It, it, uh, it can. Most of the time it infects the peripheral nervous system. When it gets into the brain, it causes encephalitis, and that's a problem. But we will talk about that in pathogenesis. Do the ligase make circles of host nucleic acids? No, they don't. The ligases end, uh, join ends of DNA, but not to make them circular uh, during, uh, say, replication uh, when you have to join ends after you remove an RNA primer and fill in the gap, that sort of thing. Are there any innate immune sensors that recognize foreign DNA in the nucleus? Yes, there are. Uh, both cytoplasm and nuclear sensors for DNA, yep. Yeah. To antibody stain DNA binding protein, are cells fixed? No, you have to fix the cells always. Yes, they will, the antibodies will not get in uh, across the plasma membrane unless you fix the cell. If you don't, you're just going to be staining plasma membrane proteins, which in this case is not useful, right? Does pox fold back? No, I don't believe it does. No. 
I thought physics was most life perspective altering twisting science, but virology is proving itself to be a dark horse. For I think in a different way, right? Physics and math do mind twisting in ways that are very different because they are physical and mathematical ways to explain the universe, essentially, right? I mean, viruses, it's a different thing, but I agree, it's mind-bending. And I think most people don't appreciate it, which is why I do all that I do. I want people to appreciate it. That's my sole purpose, is just to spread the word about viruses. How come cell mRNAs do not bind onto pox virus strands while they're being made to disrupt their replication? Why would cell mRNAs bind pox? There, there aren't any complementary. You're talking about viral mRNAs that are made, which would then hybridize to, uh, well, uh, the, that's why there's a factory where the DNA synthesis occurs. And the, the RNA, the protein synthesis is occurring elsewhere in the cytoplasm on ribosomes. It's compartmentalized in a way. Earlier, tension was mentioned. Are measurements of tension along DNA strands able to be made? You know, I don't know. I think there there are there are physical chemists that can do that. I'm I'm not familiar with it. I'm sorry. I don't know how long I can tag along with me missing some concepts. Everything becomes more gobbledygook. Well, I'm sorry that you think it's gobbledygook. Um, I think a lot of people have issues, but they they do persevere and they do pick up things. But it does take some effort to go back. I mean, if you've missed something, you, you can go back and re-listen. If you don't have time, I understand that. But um, it can be done, I think. Okay, let us uh, see what we have here in terms of the quiz. Show the results. So what makes pox different is DNA synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm. That's the only thing. The RNA primers are, are used for sure, but they're, they're also used for, by other polymerases. DNA synthesis strand displacement, that happens with others. So it's just the um, cytoplasmic synthesis. Uh, what is a viral origin of replication? Let's take a look at them. We've got a number of virus genomes that we've talked about today with origins of replication, the SV40, parvovirus, herpes simplex, multiple origins, adenovirus, two origins. By the way, you have a lot of origins in your chromosomes, right? Many, many, many origins of replication. Otherwise, it would take forever to, to copy your DNA. We knew nothing of origins until people started studying SV40 DNA. This gave us the concept of an origin of replication. We could not get that from studying host DNA. It was too complicated. So one of the billions of ways that viruses have illuminated cell biology. Origins are AT-rich segments recognized by viral or origin recognition proteins and where DNA replication begins. And I told you they're AT-rich because AT base pairs are easier to denature than GC base pairs. That's where the DNA replication machines assemble, and I've shown you a couple of examples of that today, and some can have multiple origins, some have just one. Here's a close-up view of some origins. We've already looked at the SV40 origin, which is at the very beginning or end of the DNA sequence. Again, at over the core origin, AT-rich sequences, which are in green, large T-binding sites, that's an origin recognition protein, um, and they overlap with uh, the, the transcriptional unit, the uh, early transcriptional unit. Here's SV herpes simplex 1, one of the origins, ORI uh, L. Here it is with AT rich sequences, uh, sequences bound by the origin recognition protein. And you can see on either side, very close, there are two start sites for transcription of two genes, UL29 and UL30. So the origins in transcription sites are often very close and overlapping. And finally, adenovirus 5, the origin is the end of the DNA. That's where the 
uh, polymerase with the terminal protein bind, and there's that yellow sequence recognized by origin recognition proteins. There's an AT-rich sequence to help denature the DNA in the beginning. And here are two binding sites for transcriptional regulators involved in the immediate early transcription unit. Um, and just to review what we've talked about, right? T antigen is the origin recognition protein of polyomaviruses. It binds specifically to DNA at the origin. The Rep6878 protein of parvoviruses binds the ends. It introduces NICs. It's also involved in unwinding of the DNA. The adenovirus uh, preterminal protein binds uh, at the ends, with the, and so it's bringing the polymerase in as it's doing so. And in the case of herpes virus, the UL9 is the origin binding protein, uh, which uh, here's herpes up here, which is in red, uh, which recruits viral proteins, including the polymerase, to the uh, AT-rich origin and then helps to unwind the DNA. So in all cases, the origins are bound by origin binding proteins, which then recruits the DNA replication machinery, which can be viral or cellular, depending on the size of the viral genome. The uh, DNA, these origin recognition proteins that we've been talking about, like T antigen, uh, the rep protein of uh, parvoviruses. Here's another one. This is a papillomavirus uh, origin binding protein. It's called E1. This is a bovine papillomavirus, which was studied for many years because people couldn't get human papillomaviruses to reproduce in cells and culture. So these are proteins that bind origins. They're DNA binding proteins, of course. And they all have a very similar protein structure. So here is an alpha carbon trace of the structure of each of these origin binding proteins. Uh, and you can see they have a very similar structure consisting of a beta sheet in the middle with multiple beta strands shown in red, uh, and then a variety of alpha helices. So these clearly evolved from a common ancestor and diversified to be slightly different according to the virus. The, AA, the uh, parvovirus rep protein has, in addition, another activity. It's an endonuclease, right? It nicks the DNA to eventually allow the two strands to be separated or resolve terminal resolution, we call that sort of similar function as the topoisomerases for DNA. Uh, SV40 DNA replication to separate the two products. So it has a, an active site for the endonuclease, which of course the other two origin binding proteins do not. Now SV40 large T antigen is one of the world's most studied proteins. There's actually an acronym for it, which I don't remember. World's most studied protein because so many laboratories have studied this protein. Why? Well, first, SV40 was one of the first viruses to be studied in great detail with respect to DNA synthesis and transcription. But also, it's got so many activities in it. And here's a, a diagram of the large T, 708 amino acids, right? And look at all these different activities. So let's see something that you might write. Okay, here, in the middle, this segment, origin DNA binding. That's the part of large T that binds the origin. If you muck with these amino acids, the, the protein won't bind the origin. The other ones are not so important for binding the origin, but they have other activities. For example, uh, there's part of the protein that has helicase activity, unwinding the double-stranded DNA. Here's a part that binds polymerase alpha to recruit it in. Remember, that's the polymerase that makes the primers and short DNAs. It binds to large T. And there are other binding sites as well. So large T, fascinating protein. There's actually also a, a binding site for RB here, which we're going to explore in a moment, retinoblastoma protein. T antigen is a species-specific DNA binding protein, origin binding protein. What that means is that it will not bind to DNA in the wrong species. So if you take SV40 
which is a simian virus, a monkey virus, and try to infect mouse cells, the T antigen will be made. It will bind to viral DNA. But then the, the sequence of T that binds the polymerase alpha is incompatible with the mouse polymerase alpha. So even though T antigen of SV40 will bind SV40 DNA in a mouse cell, that's no big deal, right? It's a viral DNA, a viral protein. Then when it comes to the mouse polymerase alpha to bind T, it doesn't work. So replication stops there. That's what we mean. It's a species-specific uh, DNA binding protein. The other activity, which is really important, not only for today, but for thinking about transformation and oncogenesis, which we'll get to in a couple of weeks, is that this protein binds and sequesters cell cycle regulators. And no, spike of SARS-CoV-2 is not the world's most studied protein because this protein was studied for over 50 years and you, it's going to take more than a couple of years of spike. And spike studies have been limited to mostly structure and antigenicity. And I would argue that you, we've learned so much more about cell processes from studying T antigen. T antigen causes cells to enter S phase. Why do we care about that? Let's go. Let's explore that now. This is really cool. Most of the cells in your body are not dividing. They don't need to. Exceptions are epithelial cells that say mucosal surfaces. They're always falling off, getting damaged. They need to divide and get replaced. But you know, your brain cells are not dividing. Certainly your immune cells divide. Uh, muscle cells don't need to divide unless you're bulking up, exercising, want to get big muscles. Most cells in your body are not dividing. So if they're not dividing, they're not doing DNA synthesis. And that's a problem for DNA viruses that need to tap into the DNA synthetic apparatus of the host. These viruses will not reproduce well in quiescent cells. Quiescent means they're not dividing. So what's the solution? A, a virus can't detect whether a cell is dividing or not before it gets in, right? There's no flag on the surface of a cell saying, I'm not dividing, and the virus can avoid that. No. Viruses will bind, they will get in, and then if the cell's not dividing, are they dead in the water? No. No, not at all. The virus can kick the cells into dividing. They can do it. It's so cool. They, and not every virus does this. You know, the, the, some viruses don't care about the nucleus. They got everything on their own. A pox and the memes don't care. So they're not going to, they could go into any cell and, and reproduce. Doesn't matter because they don't need the nucleus at all. But many viruses need to kick the cells into dividing. And that is done by early gene products, which is an early gene product that you've heard of. Yeah, T antigen. So here's the cell cycle. It's about a 24-hour division period. You have mitosis, M in red, which is basically when the two cells break apart. Now you have from one, you have two cells, and now each cell gets an equal amount of DNA. But after division, you now have a period of cell growth, G1, where the cells get bigger because they've now split the cytoplasm into two, so they're small, so they get bigger. Then they go into S phase where the DNA replicates. You need to build up twice the amount of DNA because you're going to share it among two cells. And then there's a little G2 where they're getting ready. And then M is the division. So you now got a big cell with two times the amount of DNA. It splits in two. That's the cell cycle in a nutshell. It's controlled in a variety of ways, but for today's discussion, this RB protein is a big one. It's the retinoblastoma, encoded by the retinoblastoma gene of the cell, or RB. It controls entry into S. This protein is sitting here. It will not let the cell go into S unless, certain con unless it has to. Certain conditions are met, which we will talk about later. And so most cells are arrested at RB, and viruses have to overcome that. And in fact, kids who don't have uh, this gene, RB deletions, get tumors. They get retinoblast tumors, which are only present in the first five years of life. So this is a childhood tumor. But the reason is that if you remove RB, the cells keep dividing forever, and that is a recipe for cancer, as we'll see later. 
All right, so how do, how do viruses overcome RB? Brilliant early region proteins. SV40 large T, papillomavirus E17, adenovirus E1A. Remember, these proteins, they're in pink. They bind RB. That's one of their functions. Remember on the picture of uh, the T antigen of SV40, there's an RB binding site. Well, also E1A and E7 will also bind RB. Why is that important? We've actually seen this slide already. RB is normally bound to a set of transcription proteins called E2F, which hit, which bind to promoters and silence the promoters. They recruit histone deacetylases, which silence the promoters. The genes are genes needed for cell division. They encode replication proteins and other proteins involved in mitosis. These genes regulated by RB are needed for DNA synthesis and to pass through the cell cycle. So if RB is bound to E2F, the cell doesn't divide because the proteins aren't made because the mRNAs are turned off at this level. So when, by the way, the cell can regulate this. If its cell needs to divide, it can phosphorylate RB and it pops off of E2F and now these promoters are active and the cell will, will pop into division. But viruses make immediate early or early proteins. E1A is an immediate early of adenovirus. Large T is an early protein of SV40. Those proteins bind RB and they activate these promoters and now you get past the RB block in the cell cycle, the cells start to divide. The cells make DNA synthesis proteins the virus can replicate. How brilliant is that? You could not make this up. You couldn't make it up. I'm sorry, nobody could do this. So that is how cells get kicked into mitosis by viruses. We're gonna see a downside of that in a couple of weeks when we talk about transformation and oncogenesis. But Next time, Wednesday, we're going to talk about reverse transcription and integration. This is an awesome topic. Well, I think every one of them is awesome. and But this one is pretty unique, so be sure to come back. We're going to talk about retroviruses and hepatitis B virus. All right, so now let's check out some questions. Okay, there was our last one. Yeah, I think you need to review these. You're not going to get it in one go. And that's why I have always recorded these lectures for my Columbia University students whose job it is just to study, right? And they have to look at it over and over again. Now, if you can't, I understand. But don't quit. Just come. I don't want to see you go because I think you're going to get something out of it. And yes, as you go along, you will learn the vocab. You will pick up concepts that are repeated over and over again. And if you ask questions, I will answer them to my best ability. And look, you are 150 people in the world of billions who are interested in doing this. You're quite unique. It's cool. Are you teaching in person or only online? I teach... Um, no, we're, we're back in person at the university. I've taught a couple of lectures. In fact, Wednesday I do a lecture in person. Um, and in the spring I teach this course in person at Columbia. Um, so we did online last year, but everything is back in person now at Columbia University. Uh, this is a challenging course. Prereq biology, introductory biology uh, course at Columbia, which means you, you can't take this as a freshman because the, the biology courses are freshman courses. Thank you, Mr. X, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. Oh, by the way, if you're here, hit the thumbs up. That's kind of helps spread the word, right? Thank you again, Mr. X. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Marge716. I love this stuff. Thank you, Kate, for your contribution. Thank you, SARS, for your contribution. Thank you, Barb Mack, for your contribution. I've started Fever and Hooked. Yeah, Fever is great. 
Okay. Do the proteins produced by DNA viruses often have different concentration thresholds to bind their targets function? Oh, yes, of course. They all have different thresholds. I mean, of course, it depends what proteins you're talking about. But even the origin binding proteins will have different thresholds uh, because, you know, depending, in some cases, there's more than one origin and so forth. So, yes, absolutely. Large T is also an ATPase. Yes, um, that is because energy is needed to unwind the DNA and probably for other activities of T antigen. So the ATP provides the energy. ATP hydrolysis provides energy. If a virus kicks otherwise quiescent cells into S, would that not be a tumor? It depends on whether the virus kills the cell or not, right, Jeff? If the virus kills the cell, then is no tumor going to be formed. But if the cell lives, yes, it could become a tumor. And stay tuned for how that happens. Because, yes, some viruses do cause cancers, and this is one of the mechanisms for sure. But you're going to have to come back. I think you will. I've seen you here so far. Could antivirals attack DNA replication? Yeah, for sure. There are a number of antivirals that, in fact, specifically inhibit DNA synthesis, and we will talk about those in the antiviral lecture. You know, you're going to hear about it pretty much all in this course. I mean, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an overview. It's a survey, but you're going to touch on everything, and then you can use that to go into more depth for sure. Thank you, Mr. X. And I know you don't like to see these donations, uh, Jared, but they're really helpful to pay for our expenses, okay? I recall a baby that had a retinoblastoma. Do most survive? I believe they do, but they may have to remove the eye, though. Yes, absolutely. How much RB blocker inside a virus to start replication? Seems like it would have to be a lot. Well, it's a little think about virus getting into one cell, right? And then the DNA is transcribed. You start to make T antigen. And you don't have to hit all the promoters at once, right? You can start at low level. So it's all a matter of mass action. Thank you, John, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. And I know it's distracting, but I have to thank everyone who is uh, – Involved. Too many abbreviations. Well, I'm sorry. Um, if we spelled out all the words, um, that would be a problem also. But eventually, I think you will get it. Thank you, John, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. Are there specific viral genomes in our DNA? Absolutely. And we will be talking about them. Here we go. Good words from Vanity. Please do not feel like you're drowning. I promise as a former student, it's manageable. Regardless of how much may go over your head, you will take away a great deal of info. Yes, Vanity took this course beginning of when? Summer of 2020. So, and everybody has trouble. It's not easy. You will get through it. The last quiz question, why is the answer B? Let me see. DNA synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm. D, none of the above. Why is pox DNA? No, DNA synthesis for pox does occur in the cytoplasm. Yep. Basic biology. I don't have a basic biology course, but you should go to Khan. They have great, or MIT course, open courseworks. They'll have, they'll have basic biology for sure. And I, I appreciate who's those who do donate, but you don't have to donate to be here. But you know how it works. People who enjoy something like to donate towards it. And obviously, I would do this without donations because I love teaching. But I do appreciate it, and it helps with our expenses. If virus removal of RB causes cancer, it, it, you'll have to wait to the transformation in cancer lecture, okay? Really. And um, 
we're working on a, on a glossary, and we'll we'll hopefully get that out before the course is over. Okay. Now, bacteria do not reproduce in a similar fashion. Remember, bacteria reproduce by binary fission. They're not dependent on getting into a cell and manipulating the cell. So, completely different ball game. Yep. Yeah, this is a lot of work, and that's why there are just 160 people who are sitting in on it, right? But I have to say, the um, when I put the lectures up for my Columbia course, you know, they get 50, 60, 70, 80, 100,000 views, so a lot of people like to look at them. Maybe they look at them for 10 minutes, I know. But, hey, I'm just doing my thing. Oh, you could do Patreon. Absolutely. Patreon.com slash microbe TV. You don't have to do it here. You don't have to do anything. It just I want you to learn, folks. Um, but wherever you want to uh, <laughs> contribute is fine. This is a fire hose of information. I'm sorry. It's the way it has to be. And, and believe me, I'm not covering everything. That's why they're recorded, right? That's why they're recorded so that you can go back to them uh, and listen anytime you want. So I, we could go another uh, 15 minutes. Uh, so f ask your questions now, folks. Thank you, uh, Patnala, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. Yes, and here's, here are good sources. Khan Academy, MIT Open Courseware, Coursera, edX, lots of places. But this is the virology course, folks. You're not going to find this anywhere else. People may try. But the specific combination of things uh, make this course different, if I may say so. Why is it that there's no jerkiness after like the first 10 minutes, but it's only the first 10 minutes? I don't understand this. <sighs> oh, well. Any other questions, folks? I'm happy to stay, but if not, I will leave, uh, and you can leave early. Early dismissal. Because of your lessons, I decided to do a master's in virology. Well, that's great. That's what I'd like to do is inspire people, right? That's my goal. And that's my single goal. Absolutely. Yeah, the textbooks are much deeper if you, and they're not cheap, I'm sorry, although you can get a used edition. But uh, if you don't understand something, read the, the textbook. It goes in deeper, but it will really help explain things a lot better. Open reading frame and reading frame. So an open reading frame, remember that proteins are encoded in triplets of bases, right? Three bases. And so an open reading frame is a series of three bases that can be read by ribosomes. But some of those triplets encode for stop. And so that ends the open reading frame. The ribosome stops. And so an open reading frame is a term we use to signify there's a, a portion of the DNA that could encode a, si a nicely sized protein, and we may not know what it does. That's what open reading frame or ORF means. Okay. When DNA polymerase binds to the DNA starts, is it not possible for RB to block anymore? Well, if you got to the point where DNA polymerase has been made, then RB has somehow been uh, overcome. But you could, if you then introduced RB, it could turn off all the transcription, yes, and it would just depend on how long the proteins last. So there may be a lag time before DNA synthesis stops. But I think, yes, you could block it if it came back on. I do like to call myself Earth's virology professor because I want to teach everyone virology. It's not being snide or arrogant or anything like that. I just want to teach. I think this is just the coolest subject. And look, there are a lot of other great subjects out there. I don't know anything about them. I know virology. So why don't I teach it? That's my idea. Do you know any motifs? Oh, yeah, there are for sure. They're helix turn helix. They're... Um, Acidic region. We we listed them in the transcription lecture. There are three different motifs in the DNA binding region. Yeah.
Um, all right, so the study questions, uh, maybe one solution is at the halfway point of the course, we do a massive, a two-hour live stream where people could ask me to clarify any of the questions of the past 12 lectures. How's that work? I mean, we're, we're at eight now, so we would have it in a, maybe a month or so. Okay, I'm willing to do that. What do you think? Let me know. Yes, you can use earlier lectures for sure. Absolutely. How do you spell the name of the company that makes those keychains? It's called Lanza. Well, no, that's not it. Hey, apparently they're two different companies. I didn't know that. Here. Um, so the the, um, the page I just showed you is taylorcustom.com. T-A-Y-L-O-R custom.com. Let's see if I can bring it up here on my fancy uh, taylor.com. Let's see if that gets anything. Yeah, it's there. Good. Look. Where's my... Uh, yeah. Taylor Custom. Okay. And there you go. Trilobites and Planaria. All kinds of stuff. So you can just search for virus. And the other one... Yeah, the herpes is also Taylor Custom. Yep. I have another one that's different, but I'm going to show you that later in the course. Okay. TaylorCustom.com. There you go. Taylor Custom. Uh, DNA viruses replicating continuously, or are there breaks for expression of proteins? No, there's a there's a continuum, right? There's an early phase where they make a lot of proteins, and then they make DNA, and then at the same time they make capsid proteins. So DNA occurs late, but continuous. Doesn't occur early because there are no capsid proteins early. Okay, looks like you're good with a uh, a massive a two hour. A two hour uh, review. So I'll start. I will schedule that. It'll be the same hour, you know, 11 a.m. or so, right? To make it easier. Is Lonza the producer for Moderna? Uh, probably lots of Lonzas. Let's see. Let's look up Lonza.com. Yeah, it, it looks like they do some health related stuff, but that's got to be another Lonza. Because they don't make keychains, that's for sure. <laughs> I have two questions per study. Two hours would pass quickly. I, I'm not sure. I mean, it may be that only 10 people show up, you know. We'll see. Uh, I'll run one, and if it's not enough, I'll do it again. Okay? No problem. Okay, folks, time to wrap up. Thanks so much for uh, coming here today, and um, stay safe. I'll see you Wednesday. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>